All right, we're ready. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's presentation, the last one in our Green Living Seminar this semester. I am Elena Traster, professor in the Environmental Studies Department here at MCLA. So this semester, our Green Living Seminar has focused on the theme Capitalism and the Environment. These presentations are always free and open to the public. And you can find more information about this seminar and links to recordings from prior presentations from this year and prior years at our website, www.mcla.edu slash green living. Our presentation again will last for about 40, 45 minutes or so and be followed by a question and answer session. And I'm honored to welcome tonight's speaker, David Batker. He's the founder of Earth Economics and the president of Batker Consulting. And he'll be speaking on using ecological economics to drive change. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much, Professor Traster. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a rocket presentation here through a whole bunch of different issues and ideas, and then we can have a discussion about it. And I want you to think about sort of where we are. I mentioned that earlier. Never before have we had so many people on the planet, so much energy, so much technology, so much knowledge, etc. But this economy is starting to undermine the very foundation that supports it. Our climate, our soils, our water. We're no longer short of paved roads. We're short of flood risk reduction. We're short of drinking water quality. So as scarcity changes, we need the economy to change too. And so I'm going to talk about some ideas kind of for the 21st century and some practical things. I've worked on I don't know how many hundred project, hundreds of projects, but it's exciting to think, see things actually implemented. And I hope that you will feel a little bit inspired in your career to go forward and go ahead and be inventive, work on things that really make a change. Well, the idea of the economy is really the economy is the big thing. And the environment's the little thing. Like this counts for about 2 to 3% of the GDP, gross domestic product. That's all the agriculture, forestry, value of water, uh, et cetera. Whereas this is buildings and cars and factories, et cetera. And yet, the physical reality is a little bit more like this. The economy sits within the environment. So if the big green thing is starting to fall apart, that means the economy is going to have trouble. And uh, I've worked in Louisiana for, I'm from Washington State, but worked in Louisiana for many years. And right after Hurricane Katrina, they called me right in. And it was just so incredible to see the devastation of that city with the hurricane. And so, I mean, the reality is the green is the big thing. We did a study some years ago on the watershed of Long Island Sound. North Adams is just outside <laughs> that watershed. But when you look at it, yeah, all our cities, all our houses, all our cars sit in that natural system. If it isn't healthy, we're in trouble. The economy's in trouble. So we kind of need to look at things a little bit differently. And just to give you an idea of the net value of nature, take a big breath. How much is that worth? And just think about it. Forests and plankton provided that oxygen for free, sustainably, dependably. Uh, we don't have to worry about an oxygen blackout. You know, good thing it's more dependable than our power system. Otherwise, we'd all be in trouble. It's also provided very equitably. We all get a breath, and yet it's valued as zero. And there's, we don't want to mess up the system that's giving us that abundance for free. Yeah, if you had to pay for oxygen, we'd have a higher GDP, but we wouldn't be better off. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. In ecological economics, there are three main things. Sustainability and scale. The economy needs to fit within the scale. If you tap too much out of it, it's not sustainable, just like the Southwest right now in water. Also, just distribution. How do we distribute goods and services? It wouldn't be fair if one person has it all and everybody else has nothing. And of course, efficiency is really important. And this is actually kind of a hierarchy. In the Northwest, if you don't have any salmon, it really doesn't matter how, what the just distribution is because you don't have any to distribute. So that scale is really important. 
and efficiency is kind of determined by distribution. If you have one person with all the money and everybody else has to kind of go with what they want, then you, the economy would be different than if everybody expresses, uh, has their, has a income that's higher and can have demand on goods and services. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, last week I was in uh, the American River watershed. Here's where it is in California. I met with the water agency. Um, here's the city of Sacramento, the capital of California. This is a really important watershed. Uh, and we asked the question, how much is that worth? How much is that watershed worth? It provides all the drinking water for a lot of people downstream, all the agriculture from lettuce that you probably get here in the Northwest and such. This is a GIS map. Mainly this is a forested area. And so when we think about sustainable scale, justice distribution, what happens with water? We can have a system where we actually produce more water, there's more snowpack, it's a healthier system, or less. And what's the distribution? How much goes to farms in the San Joaquin Valley? How much to residential use, et cetera? How much to wild salmon? This is the uh, watershed that puts cold water most directly into the Sacramento River for salmon. And how is efficiency? You know, we have a, like growing organic strawberries, Driscoll puts little water detectors all over their field and they realized that they could produce better quality strawberries and more strawberries using less water because they don't over irrigate. So they cut their water use by half and have more and better strawberries. So efficiency really does matter. Well, we just had two big fires up there, 2021, 2022. A catastrophic, and this is all shrub scrub. No, that's a fire, the King Fire from a few years ago. So how do we look at this watershed differently and change our behavior a little bit? Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that. And this, what's encouraging is people from all different political perspectives came together in a meeting we had last week and said, no matter what, we have to solve this. We have to do better. We have to replant. We have to have a different philosophy, not the, only the same species growing up at the same rate. Um, and so then we can ask these questions, scale, justice, efficiency, for all kinds of things. Like what about flood risk reduction? How, who, how do we handle floods and communities so it's more fair and the economy actually can thrive? Well, 1923, we had, I mentioned this in my other talk here earlier, how do we look at our goals for the economy, our measures, policies, and institutions? It's your job. I went to a small liberal arts college and I loved that education and it gave me real skills. I was in the natural sciences, now I'm in economics. I can work across both because I understand them better. Getting that broad education is so important for you uh, and in the future of collaboration. Well, in the 20s we had child labor. Uh, he's called the poker and if you weren't breaking coal fast enough you got jabbed in the ribs and we had we had tens of thousands of children breaking coal up and it was burned in towns like this right here uh, in homes, etc. That was kind of our economy and the idea was, yeah, children need to work. Um, and then basically, if there's one message you can pull out of this, economies transform. 10 years from now, we're not gonna have the economy we have today. Uh, in fact, when I was young, I never would have imagined that you'd have a phone that you could have a video on, talk to people, etc. So we need to advance quickly, make some progress. Uh, just to give you an idea of this, and I mentioned this earlier, prior to the 1930s, we only had microeconomics, theories of supply and demand, household economics, uh, the economics of the firm, no vision of the national economy, no measures of GDP, unemployment, inflation, they didn't exist. Then we had the depression, catastrophic, and we decided we needed new goals. And so we got new goals, new measures. For example, we got a measure of unemployment. If you want to reduce unemployment, you better measure it. And so today, thinking about what do we want out of this economy? More time, maybe more leisure, more time with our families. Do we want uh, a 6,000 square foot house or a 1,000 square foot house? Uh, the, the economy is geared toward what we view as our goals. And I think we have different goals now than we had in the 1920s. Now we have an abundance of built capital actually. Like right here in North Adams, there's a lot of houses, some that are, you know, need a lot of repairs and are abandoned. So we have housing here and yet other areas we have a shortage of housing in, in Oakland. Uh, now, as I say, maybe water quality we're short of. 
So anyway, I did start a nonprofit called Earth Economics to kind of measure some new things, measure the environment and natural systems. Infrastructure really matters in how we view of it. The 20th century is about one infrastructure, like you got floods, build levees. You need phones, put in copper wire. 21st century is about broader infrastructure. And this really matters to people. This is Superstorm Sandy hitting the Northeast. And it bashed up against New Jersey and New York. And on the November 1st, uh, Governor Christie declared an emergency because the water filtration plants were down, uh, mixed with sewage. You could not drink the water. And it was a crisis. People had to go get bottled water, or et cetera. But the storm also hit New York. On the very same day, tap water totally fine to drink. The same storm surge, the same storm. Why? Because New York's water is gravity fed out of the forests, out of the mountains, and resilient. They didn't have a big disaster. It was fine. You could drink the water the whole storm. And what did New Jersey cost? $2.6 billion to rebuild the same system that was destroyed. That was, uh, we went to FEMA afterwards, uh, started working in 2013 and said, we can't keep building the same thing because this is repetitive damage. We're geared up to get the same damage if we had the same storm tomorrow, another 2.6 billion in New Jersey. So infrastructure, putting our natural infrastructure together with our built infrastructure is really important. And, um, and to do that, we have to see nature's value. For instance, oh, I didn't put that on here. I should have put that slide here. But if you look at the balance sheet, we, we did work with um, 20 water utilities around the US. They're called the unfiltereds. They don't filter their water. And that's because the water is clean enough, in fact, cleaner than filtered water in most utilities. Seattle, New York, Boston, San Francisco, uh, Eugene, Oregon, Tacoma, Washington, Vancouver, Canada. And on the balance sheet for Seattle, we pointed out they have $1.6 billion of assets, pipes, buildings, cars. And then they have the Cedar River watershed, which is worth $48 million. Well, all that other stuff, that's the only part that produces water, is the watershed. It's the only thing that produces water quality. So it, there's something wrong when you're only looking at the thing that actually produces water is worth only $48 million, and you don't put any money to fix it up and make sure it's in good shape. Uh, so Seattle went, OK, wow, we need to change all this. This is bad. Yeah, we got to change it. And the other water utilities also, we've got some changes. So what we've done, and this is uh, work that was pioneered out of University of Vermont and some other places, is to look at nature's value. How much is nature worth? And so in that study for the Long Island Sound, in the study we're doing for El Dorado, et cetera, we look at what we call ecosystem goods and services. And we want to measure their value. This isn't measuring the intrinsic value of nature. That, and nature has that value that's intrinsic. But this is saying, at least can we value nature's work value, how hard nature works and what it does for us? So water supply. Food, we count agricultural lands. So think about goods. Goods are things you can drop on your toe, like water, food, medicine, fiber, fuel, minerals, etc. Those we can put a value to. And that watershed, El Dorado, produces it, produces these things. Then there are services. Think about that. Services are things you can't drop on your toe, like water quality, climate risk, climate stability and risk reduction, sediment soil formation, natural pest control, et cetera. Those are services we get. Well, we can also put a dollar value now on those. Um, I used to think it's not a good idea to put a dollar value on uh, nature, but I totally changed because if you want to invest in a watershed, if you want to invest in uh, wetlands, et cetera, yes, it costs money. And that means we need to justify it. And then there were what we call supporting services, pollination, like natural pollinators. Uh, most of the nation's food supply are through pollinators. Biodiversity and habitat, nutrient cycling. These things are harder to value, but we can do it. And finally, cultural value, enormous and important. Aesthetic value, you might think that's beauty. You might think, oh, well, you know, who can value beauty? Well, yes, houses that have a, a view shed 
uh, are higher value, even if it's the same house. So we can look at that value. Recreation, we have 300 categories of recreation. Um, the gross domestic product, we pointed out to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, they have an oil industry category. They have a university category. So the jobs are measured, benefits are measured, income is measured, all those for industry, for healthcare, you go on and on and on. We have hundreds of categories, nothing for recreation. Outdoor recreation is zilch. Uh, and in Washington, we showed there's like 200,000 jobs in recreation, and it brings money into rural areas from urban areas and such. So the BEA, to their credit, went, hmm, okay. Uh, and they started a pilot uh, recreation calculation now, and hopefully that will go into the actual GDP. But so thinking about how do we change things, um, we can't always get total change, but let's, make, let's improve a lot of things. And landscapes do work. That's why we have to have healthy landscapes. This landscape around here, uh, if you can imagine 100 years ago or so, was totally deforested. And it was a wreck. And a lot of, um, they lost a lot of agricultural soils. You had a lot of agricultural lands that actually were totally lost because the soils were washed out. Um, I'm going to give an example in Louisiana. We've done a lot of work in Louisiana. These are canals cut in by the oil industry. Uh, you have salt marsh, brackish marsh, intermediate marsh, fresh marsh, and you have the sinuous bayous that go through there, sheet flow, and that's how the delta is healthy and can actually the plants grow faster than sea level rise. You can get a centimeter of growth per year. But if you chop it up and now the salt comes in, kills the fresh marsh, the whole thing falls apart. And this is what's happened to Louisiana and the Mississippi Delta. We've lost 1.2 million acres of land uh, in the last uh, 80 years. This is a crisis, a big crisis. Uh, and you lose fisheries, recreation, water quality, all the rest. This is sediment. Most of the sediment is channeled off the continental shelf. But if we trap that back on the, on the uh, continent, uh, we would actually build a lot of land. The Mississippi River has 200 million tons of sediment that come down every single year. And 80 years of sediment that's stuck behind an awful lot of dams causing trouble because it's filling up the floodplains. Uh, and traditionally, it had been about 400 million tons of uh, sediment. That's why the Mississippi Delta grew throughout the last 100, 150,000 years, even through periods of rapid sea level rise, uh, because it's got such a big sediment source. Also, you've got nutrients. This is how much uh, nitrogen is coming down. And that causes a dead zone out here. So we've got several problems all at once. And we can solve many of these at the same time. One thing, we went to the Army Corps of Engineers and say, what's a bigger flood? If you looked at all the levees in the Mississippi Basin, does that provide more flood risk reduction or holding more water on agricultural lands? Obviously, actually, agricultural lands are really important. But we've been tiling those, putting pipes in to make that wet part of the field produce a little bit more corn. And then we end up flooding Cedar Rapids in major cities because all of a sudden the water comes down quickly. So we've built the wrong kind of infrastructure in the Mississippi Basin. If we change that, we can recharge groundwater. We can reduce flood risk reduction. I'll just tell one quick story. One of the most crazy things, we did a project in Iowa on this, saying let's tile less, and we took a plane and flew over, and it was weird. It was 2012, a giant drought, or 2011, big dr uh, drought period. Yeah, 2012 was a drought. Anyway, there's this green spot of corn down there. And I was like, that's weird. Everything else is like brown. So we went down there, went to this farmer. He had a pond that he maintained and wetlands up above his agricultural area. He didn't tile, put the pipes in, because he wanted to retain water on the area. And then he did no-till. So he saved three to five inches of water during the drought period. So in the, there was a flood uh, 2011, drought 2012. In the flood, he didn't contribute to floodwaters downstream that destroyed cities. And he didn't take crop insurance in 2011, because he had his crop. And so we're like, OK, that looks like a solution. Um, this is the, the BP disaster and giant oil spill. Louisiana got $20 billion out of that. 
Uh, and after, we also did a study on the Mississippi Basin Delta saying this is a trillion dollar asset. We need to invest in it to make it healthy. And one of the biggest issues I want you to think about, solutions have to be at the scale of the problem. If people are gonna live in a house, it can't be four square feet. You have to have a house that fits people. Uh, and the Mississippi Delta, they had restoration. They were like, we're, well, yeah, we're gonna restore this thousand acres or 500 acres here, forget it. We're talking about millions of acres. And so to their credit, Louisiana came out and went, we're gonna have a master plan, $50 billion. We know sea level rise is real. How do we get uh, 200 million tons of sediment back on the shelf and all that? Uh, and we did, uh, they asked us to do, and my colleague Tanya Briseño, who's fabulous, she's now in DC, worked on the economics of these diversions. So the Mississippi used to have all these distributaries providing sediment out across the, wet, the wetlands, and that's how it built. We lost 30 linear miles of wetlands in front of New, New Orleans before Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, the city was destroyed. It's actually a very well-located city. It's way back from the coast, and it was, it was located there because it was protected. So these diversions will take a lot of sediment. This, we, have, we did the economics for two. They're a billion dollars each. Uh, so they just hired the, they did all the engineering, they did the environmental uh, benefits, and they just hired the engineering companies to start construction this year. I'm really excited because uh, for deltas around the world, restoring that in uh, Bangladesh, in a lot of places, and it doesn't have to be this expensive from our perspective, uh, we'd almost like to see movable blocks where you could have a diversion here and then move it there and then move it there. Uh, less costly, but at least let's get this thing moving. This will protect and restore about 200,000 acres of wetlands. That's a lot. Um, so I'm, ex I'm excited because, you know, we can change things. Institutions can also change. Uh, we had these big fires previously. FEMA never looked at it. FEMA always has said, hurricanes are big disasters. You know, floods are big disasters. Fires, eh, not that big of a deal. And so we had this rim fire uh, and 250,000 acres burned down, and FEMA went, ah, not a disaster. And so San Francisco Public Utilities came to us and went, oh my gosh, we need to appeal this in the state of California. So we did a study showing loss of water, loss of habitat, loss of flood risk reduction, et cetera, and it was like, it's more like a several billion dollar disaster, and to their credit, FEMA went, okay, yeah, okay, we will declare it a disaster. And they declared it a disaster. And this is what happens in a big fire. The soil in the rim fire was so fascinating because Stanislaw National Forest, all the same age timber, burned to the ground and deep into the ground. And that makes the soil hydrophobic. If you've ever poured water on ashes, it just runs off. And that means you get drought, fire, flood, landslides. They're not separate disasters, they're all together. We did a report for FEMA in 2015 saying that, and then FEMA went, wow, yeah, these are linked to disasters, so you gotta do something right after the fire so that you don't get flood afterwards. Uh, this is the area of the Rim Fire, and, what, and these are past fires in actually, um, in uh, Yosemite National Park. And so Yosemite had all these fires, and one of the fascinating things was the same fire, totally moonscape on Stanislaw National Forest, then it burned over this granitic ridge into Yosemite. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, Yosemite's gonna burn up. And then it was about this tall. Uh, it was a ground fire, and it burned more or less just the uh, fuel that was down there. It didn't affect the big trees. Then the next year, and I think this is going to transform forest policy in the United States. Stanislaw National Forest, the same snow melt came. It all melted, ran off, caused flooding. We couldn't capture it. It's bad water quality. In Yosemite, the, you have these big trees. The snow falls through the trees. The th trees shade it, so the snowpack lasts a long time. 80% of your water storage in, in the west coast there is in snowpack. It's not in dams. Even in Washington state with 300 dams, big dams, only 20%. <laughs> so 
So we have to preserve that. And that snowpack is going to move up as climate change takes place. And yet some areas, like San Francisco's water supply is totally safe because it's way up high in Tuolumne Fields. And so you're going to have snow there. And we're going to have years like this where you have massive snowfall. So if we had more diverse forests, larger trees, don't just manage for a 50-year cut, manage for water, manage for flood risk reduction, we're going to do better. And we have a study right now, we're just finishing for the state of Idaho, and Idaho is going to change things. It's very exciting. Idaho knows that what doesn't work because they've had some big fires and all. So we're going to have some exciting changes in Idaho. Well, then we went to FEMA and went, well, you have to value uh, nature. And FEMA said, yes, we know we can do better. We can avoid repetitive damage. We can help communities and people better if we actually value nature. So they did this ecosystem service valuation, which plugs right into their benefit cost analysis. And it shifted their whole portfolio of projects. So one thing we were saying is, um, what if we had a climate change agency in the US to do climate mitigation and adaptation? And we, we have one, it's FEMA. <laughs> they, should be, they should be thinking about climate change. Well, after this was approved, I think in 2013, we had like a whole sweeping set of policies at FEMA. So it is a new agency. Uh, I'm really, and it was fascinating because whether it was uh, Obama, Trump, they made all these advances through all administrations, but they gave very economic anal analysis. In fact, the thing I just showed you, um, the first administrator under the Trump administration said, what's this environmental benefits? I kind of don't like it. We, maybe we should get rid of it. And then the FEMA uh, guy who was in charge of this, Jody Springer, said, well, here's, 30, here's our analysis, 30,000 projects. Here's what you would have and repetitive damage if we didn't use that. And here's what you have if we do use it. And it saves billions of dollars. And then he went, oh, well, why aren't we using this more? And they actually expanded it 300 times <laughs> what it had been. So this is kind of institutional change to thinking about making these arguments. This is the Thomas fire, and I was there uh, also, another 250,000 acre fire. But by this time, so 2000, this is 2017, FEMA was like, get out there and replant. Go do it. Here's money. You know, make it happen, because we don't want floods. So just between 2013 and 2017, we had a lot of policy change. Uh, and it's really exciting. So I think uh, as you go forward in your careers, sometimes I'll say, be the first one to say, it feels like you're absolutely hitting your head against the wall. Uh, but sometimes it comes through and you're like shocked and surprised <laughs> something worked out. This is a landslide. Uh, again, like landslides were after that. And then 2016, we had more changes. So they, oh yeah, this was, I'll just mention this too. When you get change and you're working on it, it's 95% of the work to get a little bit of change. And then it's like 5% more work to get 100 times more change. So think about that. So we got FEMA to change and then on their benefit cost analysis. And then benefit cost analysis in the United States has not been changed since 1985. That's sad. And it's required by law for Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Transportation, HUD, everything else. If you don't have benefits greater than one over costs, it doesn't count. But we're not including the environment. We're not including communities uh, in a lot of ways. And so then we went, and the federal government, we had a big process, a lot of meetings uh, in the White House to change all of federal benefit cost analysis. And uh, at first, I have to say, the Army Corps was the biggest foot dragger. And they were like, can't be done. Nobody can do it. Oh, we can't measure that stuff. It would be a disaster for benefit cost analysis. We'd never build a levy again. And we're like, no, you'll build levies again. You'll just do it better. Uh, and so, but at one key meeting, I mentioned this at lunch, we bought Jody Springer from FEMA. They, FEMA wasn't even invited to these meetings. So we brought him in and said, he has to be able to speak. And the chair, who was with the Office of Technology, and, in, and um, environment said, so brought this meeting going and the Army Corps gave their blurb about how it can possibly work. And then I said, well, why don't you ask Jody Springer? And he's in the back of the room, a very uh, introverted kind of character, turned bright red and was like, stood up and went, well, 
we've had it in place for like three years and it's been totally successful. Of course you can measure all these things. Here's how we measured, here's how we used it. That's no problem, everybody could do it. Army Corps is crazy. And then, and, then, and then it was like this giant shift in the meeting and, and they just went, okay, that's it, we're gonna approve, we're gonna change it. And it was changed for all federal agencies. Um, so that, and then we got this cost benefit of drought, ecosystem services, wildfire, uh, FEMA also advanced further. Um, I wanted you to think also, we have this legacy in our country of racism, which is so apparent when you look at disasters. Uh, in the Mississippi Basin, um, I mentioned just in, earlier in the meeting too, like Baton Rouge, there's an area of Baton Rouge that's called the Bottoms. It's an African American community. It is at the bottom. And so it always gets flooded. How can you, how can you advance if your house is consistently flooded and what happens when an agency goes, all we're going to do is rebuild it at the same elevation and the same square footage so that you get flooded again. I mean, that's, that's like catastrophic. You can't sell your house, you can't get out, you're trapped. And um, so we have a lot to do on that. Oh, so FEMA, to their credit, we worked with FEMA to say, how could we have an, a new equity policy in FEMA? And the way that, um, it, this took a lot of time, but the way it manifested itself was we said, any house, and actually below $250,000, but a lot of houses are $50,000, $40,000 that are repetitively flooded. FEMA can, doesn't have to do a benefit cost analysis, which they had on all their other projects, because we showed it's 300% benefit if you take action to prevent future victimization on those floods. And to their credit, FEMA went, okay, that's it, we're gonna apply, we're gonna do it. Uh, and they, they approved that policy so that it's instant approval. So if somebody who's flooded uh, and has lower house value, $250,000 lower, you can take that action. And if the homeowner wants their home raised so that it won't be flooded again, or if they wanna move out to a closer area or whatever, they can do it. And to me, that was uh, an equity policy that was so important to have disadvantaged communities actually have more access faster to get things fixed. Uh, this is the ninth ward, I was there. And I think if you don't, it's so easy to do things wrong. Uh, this is the ninth road war, ward, and I can't tell you, so that barge there came in, that was the breach. In the middle of uh, 4 a.m., you know, 23 feet of water, 1,200 people died just like that overnight. Uh, and the lack of leadership is so damaging. So the Ninth Ward is an area of wetland, uh, African-American community, and it's subsiding, so it's getting lower and lower. Uh, and at the time, the mayor just went, okay, just if you wanna build on the same slab, go ahead. You wanna build it higher, whatever you wanna do, just go ahead. That was total lack of leadership. They could have actually brought in 20 feet of soil like Seattle did. Uh, they filled in the area that was flooded in the eight, early 1900s to raise part of the city that was constantly flooded. Uh, this was a chance to actually do some really dramatic change and improve this area and keep the community there. As it is, about 40% uh, did not move back, and it was rough. So if we don't, things right, don't do things right, then we consistently get more damage. And this area, I think, is, was a, you see some houses that are 20 feet out, up, some houses right on the same concrete pad. Um, so um, these are more, yeah, this was the, the, the policy I mentioned for all ecosystem services in federal decision making and benefit cost analysis. And, Three big agencies did it, Office of Science and Technology, so it's kind of hard to repeal, let's say. Um, oh, and then, again, it's in your own community, you can see who, who's making decisions that are important, like Office of Budget and Management. What in the world? I never even heard of it, really, until we were working with Seattle Public Utilities, and they said, well, we can't lower this, we can't think about the future differently because the federal government requires us to have this 7% discount rate. In a nutshell, um, this is my son, uh, Raphael, when he was younger, but how do we look at the future? How do we value the future that's so important? Um, right now we have a mathematical model, basically. We say we're gonna, the OMB said all federal agencies, we don't care who you are or what you're doing. You use a 7% discount rate. That means every single year 
you take the value off 7%. 7%, 7%, 7%, 7%. So the feature is worth very little. If you have a lower discount rate, like 1%, 2%, that means the future is worth a whole lot more. So think about this, even in Louisiana. So FEMA brought up that this is catastrophic. We, we can't have this high discount rate. Say you could build a levee or do that big diversion for wetland restoration. Actually, we need both. But on the first day that diversion operates and puts all that sediment out there is its worst day of operation. Because every single year, another 20 million tons of sediment go out there, another 20 million, another 20 million, all of a sudden you're building these wetlands. You invest in a levee, very first day is its best performance. After that, it's going downhill. Brodens burrow into it, storms hit, trees fall over, boats hit it, whatever, down it goes. And so you're going to have to redo that. <laughs> you're going to have to refurbish it sooner or later. So do we invest in long term or do we invest in short term? And of course, you have to have both. I have another, I didn't show this on this slide, but after Hurricane Katrina, there was an area of wetlands. And you can see where the wetlands were, the levee was overtopped but totally in place. And then there's an open water area, it was punched out. So it was like your bathtub overflowing versus punching a side in it, the side out of it. Uh, and the levee was totally demolished because the storm surge had no buffering with those wetlands. So FEMA, in 2000, we started working on OMB back in 2012, I think. And it seems hopeless. They kept saying, no, we're not going to change. We're not going to change. All federal agencies, we have to treat them all the same. All The future has to be treated the same for all agencies, all projects, everything. And then 2021, uh, the OMB said, let's, um, oh, FEMA said, please write a paper for us. We have all these case studies. We need this policy change. So we wrote a paper with uh, Rowan Schmidt, my colleague, and Tanya Briseño, and uh, saying, just give an exception for FEMA for one year. And so the OMD did. They said, go ahead, you use a 2.5% discount rate. And all that year, different projects were approved. Like before, if you have a power outage, you get a generator, because the generator provides instant benefits, but not long-term investment in the different power uh, distribution system, et cetera. And, those, and they keep having problems, <laughs> one generator after generator. Anyway, then this year, only three weeks ago, OMB came through and went, oh, we're going to change it to 2.8% across all federal agencies. And I can't tell you what a celebration we had for a tiny group of people who <laughs> worked on that. But it's going to mean the entire portfolio gets shifted to value the future more. More fundamental, though, is like Herman Daly and the Ecolo Ecological Economist, because they say the decision about the future isn't a calculation with a discount rate. It's an ethical decision. That's what it really is. So how do we make a more fundamental change that says now we're going to value the future uh, because it is an ethical change? Are we just going to invest lots of money in something that falls apart or not? Uh, and across the US, I'm so fascinated by what works well. Like in the 1930s, they put this big structure above New Orleans. It works perfectly still to divert floodwaters into Lake Pontchartrain. Wow, that thing just keeps paying off. Why should we invest in things that are so, so short term? So how do we change more fundamentally how we treat the future? I'm not sure yet. You guys help solve this problem, <laughs> you know, help us. Uh, because all projects are not the same. We shouldn't use the same discount rate for every agency, every project, et cetera. Well, I wanted to just talk about some trade work that we've done, too. Uh, there used to be an explosion in the trade of toxic waste around the globe, to basically from wealthy countries to poor countries. And it's so tragic, I can't tell you. Uh, and this is electronic waste. Um, we did the first report with Basel Action Network. I was one of the founders uh, on electronic waste. And just, it's amazing, basically paying to export the waste, but actually it's just getting dumped as hazardous material. Um, this is in China, uh, and where these materials were also just burned, and you wouldn't believe how it was treated. 
they have these plastic containers with aqua regia, which is 75% hydrochloric acid, 25% sulfuric acid, to um, melt the gold, basically, and then you can precipitate the gold out of you know, electronics. And so you get a little bit of value of the gold. But people came in there, they worked for 85 cents a day and only lasted for maybe six months or so because the fumes are so toxic. Um, and so China, amazingly, this is riddled with corruption and mafias. So it's actually even dangerous. My colleague, Jim Puckett, who went out there, could only stay for a few hours and then needed to get, get out of town uh, quick. That was in Guangzhou. But then through the Basel Convention, a global agreement, 185 countries slowly signing on to ban this trade. And China banned the importation of electronic waste and in 2021 banned plastic waste. And that's why it's been a crisis in the US all of a sudden. We can't just ship our plastic to China. Uh, and so, and then also working on ship breaking, which is also um, a hazardous, we're basically shipping some value, which is steel recycling, with a bunch of asbestos and PCBs and other toxics that are not being pulled out properly. So one thing I wanted to say is that, and here we had about, um, these are, uh, their, the husband died on one of those ships, but we had, uh, not only is it important to think about national and local uh, policy, but global policy. And again, I'm really encouraged because this trade has declined precipitously. It has really gone down immensely. Uh, from we saw like 600 cases and such. Uh, now it's just a few cases. And, um, and it's forced companies, it's like putting a potato in the uh, exhaust pipe. Companies have had to clean up their um, production process so they don't produce as much hazardous waste. And this uh, campaign was accomplished with probably 350 different nonprofits around the world, really active groups in Turkey, the Philippines, uh, Brazil, etc. So they, this group of organizations really powered this international change. And then I wanted to say that thinking about our economy, when does it really work best? The, where finance goes today, that's the economy you get tomorrow. So where we invest our trillions of dollars today, that is, we're gonna get roads, we're gonna get buildings, we're gonna get natural systems, whatever it is. So we have to get our incentives right. Right now, uh, we invest $2 trillion a day in currency trading. Wait a minute, that doesn't produce a good, it doesn't produce a service, but it does redistribute wealth. So if we had a small speed bump, in other words, if there was a small tiny tax on currency trading, it would probably get rid of currency trading. And then that's gonna crowd investment into something hopefully that's better. So we do have to have the right incentives. So I want you to just think about that, uh, how finance, and now we need to think about investing in natural systems. So I'm just gonna wrap up here with um, thinking about nature again, coming back to that picture of the watershed and thinking about what produces goods and services. How do we have financial systems that actually encourage investment in natural systems? So the watershed is the provisioning area. It provides water, flood risk reduction, water quality, recreation. And then you have areas that are beneficiaries. Like we know Sacramento gets the water from the American River watershed. Uh, we know that San Francisco gets water from um, the Yosemite National Park. And then who are the impairments? So now we're using GIS mapping to say we can map where the provisioning is, we can map who the beneficiaries are, and we can map who the impairers are. So now, like Bellingham, Washington, I was mentioning, they have a $5, uh, $5 a, um, a month natural capital charge. That goes back up into the watershed, plant for planting trees and taking care of the watershed. Well, they're doing it right, and they benefit because they get more sustainable water and good water supply. Um, so we can think about having charges on the bads to pay for that and tar charges on the goods. And this sort of creates some new institutions. We have about 2,500 
payments for ecosystem services in the United States today. Local governments are the big leaders. It's very exciting. I mean, from California's uh, carbon tax to water taxes and such. And here's an example. You know, the water is provided up here, goes to San Francisco, Oakland's Bay Area, and they pay some amount to help restore and keep healthy this watershed. So with that, I think I'm going to wrap up. Um, I'll just give this last example. This is the Jean de Charles Choctaw tribe relocation. Uh, only the tribe only had 2% of their land left in Louisiana. And they voted and decided to relocate because they were finding tribal members just leaving and they won't have their community. So they decided to move their community. We helped them get a, we wrote the grant for 100, or 84 million or $48 million uh, to help them move. But what I liked about this process is the tribe actually said, we are going to kind of re-identify who we are as a community, what we're going to do, et cetera. And now they've finished all the building that the tribe has moved. They're going to work still on restoring their historic lands, which I hope will take place as part of Louisiana's, actually it's in the Louisiana $50 billion uh, restoration plan and such. But what I liked about, it was a struggle for this group, a real struggle, and yet they had pragmatism and optimism in the face of climate change. And they've, a bunch of tribal members have said, well, because we designed this, it's better than what we had before. We actually have a more cohesive community. We have better health services. We've reorganized. So thinking about the future, we need to think about how to change things so that um, we have it even better. Like Louisiana, those diversions will expand oyster production. Uh, we'll have larger oyster production with that greater amount of flow of fresh water coming in. Well, with that, I'll just wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I think I went a little bit over my time, but I hope there's enough time for questions. Thank you. So with the, the kind of the ending of sending uh, waste overseas, um, is there a possibility for a new industry to arise in the United States in terms of waste disposal? Totally. Great question. So electronic waste, I'll tell this kind of crazy story quickly. So we went, hey, we should have electronic waste recycling right here in the US because we didn't have much of an industry. So there was a company which we highlighted in a film that was exporting waste, REPC. And then uh, they threatened to sue our little tiny group. And then we said, well, bring it on. We're ready. Uh, but you have two owners. We have two people in our group. That was when we were very tiny. Uh, just bring it on. Come on over here. Or let's talk. So we sat down. And, and that, you, that one, I got to be the bad cop. And my colleague was the good cop. So I said, uh, thank you for this letter threatening to sue us. We're going straight to Channel 5. And we are going to just crush you guys. Because you think anybody's going to take their recycling to you after we give further press on this and everything else? And then my colleague, Jim, went, what's wrong with you? You should be recycling. Why don't you become the model company for recycling electronic waste? Uh, so, and then they went, oh man, well, the whole thing is we're not trying to do anything bad. Uh, okay, we'll do that. And so then we had a, um, a uh, recycling, so Basel Action uh, Network did a um, uh, certification for recyclers. We got uh, 30, 40 recyclers in the US to start processing and recycling electronic waste, which was really good. And REPC grew by five times and then 10 times, because Microsoft, all the universities said, we're going to send it to REPC because they're recycling and doing well. Well, um, so most of those recyclers are still doing well, but the story about REPC was not a good one. Because then in 2000, I guess it was about 2000, 14 or 13, they went, ah, we don't need your, your, um, your certification anymore. We don't want you coming in here. We're just doing it great and we're fine. Uh, and so then my colleague Jim went, are they lying to us? Let's put some trackers on. So they put, he put GPS trackers on the electronic waste. Sure enough, they were exporting it to Pakistan. So bad. And they were busted. And so he took it to the EPA, but the one that got them was the IRS, because they weren't reporting this income, and they went to prison. They got five-year sentences, the two guys that we had dealt with earlier. 
Uh, and then we're like, how could you do that? We helped you get you grow your company in like 10 times, and then you decided to cheat. It's so bad. But for the electronic industry, there's a there's an there's an industry magazine called Imaging, <laughs> which which you might think is for models or something, but it's for the uh, uh, the copier industry, they put it on the co front cover. You know, don't mess with trying to export your stuff because you're going to go to jail. Look at what happened to REPC. Uh, and so I think that you know it's fascinating. Just in the real world, when you keep track of stuff, uh, when you have good actors, bad actors, whatever. But but a lot of companies are doing very well on recycling uh, in the U.S. right now. So I'm interested in the mm -hmm. the idea of like who pays for for some of these ecosystem services. So talking about um, something like the, the water example of paying the, the beneficiary of like clean water paying for restoration upstream and stuff like that. But what about a case like, I don't know, where, where the beneficiary of maybe mitigation or like restoration doesn't have the money to pay, like they've been burned in the past, like where, where does this come from? I think that's a great question. And there's a couple pieces I would say to it. One is also, what if you have a super poor community that doesn't have the money to pay there? Um, for ecological economics, you try to do one thing with one policy. So say we do a natural resource policy, pay f to fix things upstream. Then you want an equity side to say, OK, we don't want people who are too poor to pay that. Then you need a second action, which would be, OK, maybe you get 100 gallons a month or whatever free. But if you consume over that, now you have to pay a certain amount. Or if your income level is here, then you don't have to pay the natural capital charge. So that's a piece. And this, we, this problem we have certainly all over the whole US is how do you set who pays? Uh, and how do you mark that out? Uh, one th so that's a really good point. Right now in Silicon Valley, we're looking at a funding me mechanism that would charge uh, large companies based on square footage. This is the, this is the um, Santa Clara Open Space District is proposing this fee. And I think it's really fascinating because <laughs> they're, they're having a certain square footage that's not charged. Uh, so if you're under that square footage, and if you're, but you're over it, you're going to get this charge. Uh, but they're don't, not having total resistance because it's also where the water is coming from for Silicon Valley to conserve the upper watershed and such. So uh, yeah, but each I think each place has to be examined for its own uh, qualities to understand how it needs to be designed. So. Um I thought that the concept of um, how, like, that the uh, when they switched, um, or when the Trump administration came in, they were initially skeptical about that the environmental factors in FEMA, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, and then when it was yep. described as actually this saves a lot of money and it's economical and all that, it became, it, it, it lost its ideological factor and just became good policy. But, you know, throughout you know, this seminar, I'm just uh, looking at the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. It is an inherently ideological mm -hmm. beast, if you will, with a lot of issues switching from being Paul, like a pragmatic issue to being moral or being, and so like, does this seem to you like it makes sense for a course correction in the mindset of the environmental movement of sort of surrendering the culture war issue and instead switching towards arguments that are, you know, considered that are denounced frequently, like, oh, it's economically better. Oh, it's for this reason or that reason. That's a great question. And I think some of my friends and colleagues who breathed the most fire on the work I do are from the environmental movement. And they're like, what do you mean? You're, we do not like the idea of putting a dollar value on nature. That is a very bad idea. 
Uh, and it's hard, and, but you know, it's okay. I'm pretty fire resistant. They can uh, <laughs> they breathe fire, and, and some of them have really come around because we've shown that this is how you get a funding me mechanism for conservation. You get money to do conservation this way. Uh, like with land conservancies, FEMA had some of the first purchases. They never purchased land for a land conservancy. But the Ventura fire that I showed you, we worked with the Ojai Land Conservancy. They put in a two and a half million dollar proposal to purchase land they'd never ever get. But it had all these invasive species and it's why the fire swept up and into housing. So they said, we will maintain it, but let it be, because if you have oak forest, it's actually more, it's fire resistant. And the shade keeps the grass down and such. So the natural system is actually more fire resistant. It still has some fires, but you want those to come through regularly. So FEMA approved it. Uh, and it, 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 that, that kind of finally went through. But as far as the, and then the environmentalists who were breathing fire on me went, what? We can get money for this? The, okay, it, it sounds kind of good. <laughs> But I'll tell you um, a really controversial case I worked on, uh, and it is a challenge. There was a, there's proposals for deep sea mining, and um, so deep sea areas, one, it's 52% of the globe's solid surface is deep sea. It's a lot. It's such a huge area. And I think there are reckless proposals, and then we had one company called Nautilus, and they brought in Scripps, uh, Woods Hole, and all this to survey this area down by New Guinea. So they were going to mine, they had a proposal to mine an area of 11 hectares. And that was 20% copper. It's kind of mind boggling. And they're not mining where the vents are and where you have a lot of life, because it's too hot. That's about 900 degrees, but they're mining on the slope the downslope of that. So they asked uh, me and my colleagues to do an analysis, ecosystem services and such. And so we did that, and, it, and this I hope will go for, it's gonna move forward in the mining world, but we said, if you're gonna get copper, how much CO2 emissions, how much water damage, how much biodiversity, how much impact do you do? And they actually proposed total restoration of the site. In other words, they were gonna take their survey, all the species that were, were there and bring them back. That 11 hectares replaced a, would replace a 3,000 hectare mine on the eastern slope of the Andes. These mines are proposed copper mines. There you're mining 0.01% copper. Uh, and we have to move 300, just an, in, what is it? You know, about 100 million tons of material overburden to get to the copper. And so it's just mind boggling the difference in footprint. So I said it's a good idea. And boy, did people at the go, <laughs> I'm telling you, and some of my dear friends who worked for me for a while, they're like, that's the most disastrous idea on the planet. Uh, and I said, well, you're saying we need renewable energy and we're going to have to consume more copper. We recycle almost, we have really good recycling rate for copper because it's worth a lot, but we still don't have enough. So what it, it's hard decisions. What I, I think is we still have a lot of hard decisions. How do we go about it? I think it would be good to try out that 11 hectares, personally. It's 5,000 feet down. There actually isn't much life there. There's about 20,000 um, hot vents around there. And so surprisingly, it's an ecosystem that's pretty large. And it's not like, in some areas like the Galapagos, you've got one vent and it's got species that occur nowhere else. Well, no, you shouldn't mine there, for sure. Uh, but thinking about, so anyway, that's where I came down on that one, and uh, my environmental friends didn't like it. Uh, but sometimes I've done stuff where they think I'm an angel. <laughs> so, but I think these are the questions that are hard, hard questions. And how do you, so how do we look at it? Uh, so my mining for nodules is you're going to cover a much, much larger area because you're getting these little nodules over this giant area of deep sea. That's a different kind of mining. Um, so. So we've come to that point when I always promise I'll let the students get to the cafeteria, but I also always invite anyone who wants to stick around and who wants to ask questions to do so. Uh, I would like to thank our speaker so very much for coming tonight. Um, thank you all for coming and many of you who have come throughout the semester. We're glad for all of your questions over the course of the semester um, and just one more big round of applause. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks.